Hi, I'm Bill McCarran, Executive Director at the National Press Club. I'm here today with my friend Kathy Kiley. She's the Lee Hills Professor for Press Freedom at the University of Missouri. And Kathy and the club have been working for many years on a case that we wanted to talk to you about today. That's the case of Emilio Gutierrez Soto, a Mexican journalist. Uh, he's here in the States, and we want to review the case with you and talk a little bit about what we, what we learned from this case and what it means on a larger context. So, Kathy, welcome. Thank you for having me, Bill. Um, it's good to be back at the Press Club. And um, I think this is a really significant case. It's one that I was thinking about it before our conversation that I've been working on for about seven years, ever since I was a Press Freedom Fellow here for the National Press Club. And um, it really involves, um, I think, a prolonged injustice. Uh, maybe it's not so benign neglect uh, by our government, but and sometimes uh, definitely not so ben benign. But Emilio came here 100% um, legally. Uh, he, Explain what that. What well, mean? he uh, he fled <laughs> Mexico. He was a small town journalist in Mexico, so not a big fancy name, not a big well-known person, but like many many local journalists, he was covering his community and he found evidence of um, really shakedowns by the local constabulary and, um, and he reported this. And as a result, he was threatened multiple times. His house was ransacked uh, by the military and or police. Um, he was threatened in front of his then very young son and he's a single dad. And of course, in Mexico, we know it is the most dangerous country in the world outside of a war zone to be a journalist. So these are threats you can't just ignore. And being a single dad, he scooped up his son and he went to the border. He went through a legal checkpoint at which point he asked for asylum. This is the legal way you are supposed to come into the United States if you are in danger. And he did that. He was put into detention and separated from his son for several months. So, so when you follow the legal process of entry into the United States, you ask for asylum, the first thing that happens is you're put into detention. Well, in his case, yes. I mean, Normally, I, I think, you know, our, our policies tend to vary, um, but it really is uh, a crapshoot, you know, so that for the person coming in, I think it's a very uh, risky thing. And in Emilio's case, he's separated from his son for several months, but at the end of several months, the U.S. authorities determined that he had a sufficiently strong case for asylum that they paroled him and his son reunited them, and they began living in Las Cruces, New Mexico, where they continued to live for a number of years, waiting for his case to have a hearing, by which time uh, Emilio's son Oscar is a teenager. He's grown up in the United States. They have an established business. They have a food truck. They have friends. And um, at this point, an immigration judge decides he shouldn't get asylum because he can go back to Mexico the most dangerous country in the world uh, for journalists. And the judge questions whether or not Emilio is a journalist. Um, that is where we stepped in. Uh, we, we awarded the uh, Obishan Press Freedom Award, uh, I believe it was in 2017 or 18, 17, to that's right. uh, Mexican journalists. And we wanted somebody to come and speak on behalf of Mexican journalists and our uh, colleagues at the Reporters Without Borders and a, a Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, both of which organizations were represented on the committee that picked that award, both recommended Emilio. So he came here, he gave a speech, and uh, he was still, on, his case was on appeal. And uh, about six weeks after he gave that speech, um, he went for a regular check-in at the Immigration Service and he was put in shackles along with his son and piled into a car that was going to be driven to the border, which of course is very close to El Paso, and um, 
led out in Mexico, a country where he'd been threatened with death. Luckily, his lawyer, Eduardo Beckett, was able to get a stay of that. Uh, but then, in what I thought was a really vindictive move, um, the immigration authorities in El Paso jailed Emilio and Oscar. And put him back in detention, but exactly. the detention is like a jail. It is like a jail, yes. And uh, <clears throat> kept him there despite the appeals from the National Press Club, despite the appeals from the uh, Bishop of El Paso, from members of Congress. Uh, kept him there, and we really did not understand why, um, for more than seven months. All right, so here's a case where, uh, as Kathy mentioned, as you mentioned, uh, no laws were broken on entry. He followed the proper path, but he was at six or seven months in detention then. And then now he was in detention again. Again, no laws broken. So in the U.S., here's a journalist, international journalist, but he's jailed a couple of different times. He's held for punitive lengths of time, and there are no charges against him. Exactly, and that's why we at the National Press Club and the National Press Club uh, Institute uh, filed a habeas corpus case to Explain get him what that released. Yeah. So habeas corpus is basically as old as the Magna Carta. It says you can't disappear people in a democracy. Um, if you take people into custody, you must charge them within a reasonable amount of time. We felt that was being violated. And, um, and as a result, uh, we filed a case the uh, Rutgers Law School's uh, Human Rights Institute uh, brought that case. It was, despite uh, opposition from the Department of Homeland Security, which contended um, the courts had no jurisdiction here, which seems to me kind of strange, but um, the judge took the case and asked for documents that we had already been seeking uh, in a Freedom of Information Act all the communications involving Emilio because we couldn't figure out what was going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, what why were we hoping was he to being find in the Well, we, we wanted to understand because uh, DHS wouldn't tell us uh, why he was being held. And I want to be really clear here. I'm a reporter by trade. I've done this for many years. The very first thing I did when I, we found out that Emilio was being threatened with deportation, I called the DHS. I first tried El Paso, nobody answered, so I went to the regional headquarters in Dallas and I finally got someone on the phone and I said, hey, I think a terrible mistake has been made here. Uh, this guy's a journalist, he's supported by these well-known, reputed organizations, he's won an award at the National Press Club. Um, is there something about this case we don't know mm -hmm. that we need to understand? So. I gave them every opportunity to justify what they were doing, and they couldn't. So we then filed a Freedom of Information Act request for some documentation. We received heavily redacted documents, but some of which suggested that he might have been targeted or there was some sort of retaliation against Mexicans here. The judge in the habeas case uh, said, yes, that that interest me too, I would like to see these documents. Well, as some of your viewers may know, those of you, those of who are journalists and used to Freedom of Information Act requests, judges on discovery can get a lot more information a lot faster than we can through Freedom of Information. So the judge set a deadline um, for the government to turn these documents over, and interestingly, 24 hours before they were due to turn over the documents to the judge, which then, of course, would have made them public, um, the Department of Homeland Security, after all these months of refusing to release Emilio and Oscar, released them. Yeah, and I remember this part, and so... Very well. Ju this, this was a person that uh, the courts argued was a flight risk, potentially, even though he did not have, uh, or a danger to the community. I don't think they even went there, but they suggested that. No, they and did he, suggest he was a flight risk, flight which risk. is crazy, yeah. And he had a, uh, uh, um, no passport, right? His passport had been taken away, so there's nowhere he can go. Uh, and all of a sudden their concerns about that vanished the moment they were supposed to show up in federal court. 
And turnover documents. Turnover documents, right. Turnover they, they, communications. Now they didn't care that he was a flight risk anymore because yeah. they were facing a, a PR problem, right? I believe that's right. And I will be very above board here and honest and say that one of the things uh, we think we will discover when we get these documents, we have renewed our FOIA request and I have seen enough of them. Uh, they are still heavily redacted, but I think some of those redactions hide bias. And Bill, you yourself had a visit with Emilio when he was in detention where I think uh, some of that bias against, if not him personally, against the press uh, came tumbling out. So maybe you want to talk about that. Sure. Well, we did go to visit him. Uh, I went down for a day to El Paso and uh, Eddie Beckett, who Kathy mentioned, who's Emilio's attorney and is wonderful, was there. And uh, we, we went into detention. Now, there's razor wire everywhere, um, stainless steel everywhere. It just really, it looks like a, a prison. Yeah, and this is a guy who a few weeks before had been at the National Press Club at a black tie dinner with some of the most prominent journalists in Washington. Yeah, literally the last time I saw him, he was in black tie. And he's in a orange jumpsuit and, you know, he's, um, He's in a room that's restricted. We didn't go to his cell, but they brought him to a room. You know, we were not supposed to bring anything, no phones in there. Uh, we wanted to see his son too, Oscar. The, the way that had to work was we could see Emilio and then we could see Oscar, but we couldn't see them together. I don't know what that was about. Maybe that they couldn't see each other. Uh, they weren't supposed to see each other. So this is, again, this is punishment. Um, he, he didn't feel well. Uh, he wasn't sleeping well. He had. PTS, he was worried about being deported. And uh, uh, that day, also, the congressman from the area, El Paso, Beto O'Rourke, oh, he went into the cell with me and uh, he had known Emilio's case and he met Emilio that day. And so there was a lot of um, social media, you know, attention to it. But um, the, the overwhelming feeling was that this person was, he was a prisoner and he was, and he was suffering and that there was a, a clock ticking. Now we later learned that as, as a strategy, Mexican journalists had been held in these kinds of circumstances and the idea was that they might ask to be deported, which happened in a couple of cases. So it did seem punitive and it did seem difficult and that was on purpose. They wanted Emilio to say, this is terrible, just send us back. Now, Kathy can talk more about this, but in, in court, we, it was argued, or discussed, explained, that Emilio would face death threats when he returned. And this was questioned by the court. And so I just wanted to go into this a little bit and get your and get your take too, because in Mexico, when journalists are killed, I think it was eight last year, it's, it's, there's a lot of um, assassination of journalists in Mexico. There's a lot of people there who know how to do it with a silencer and drop the body somewhere that no one will see. That's not what happens when journalists are killed by and large. It's usually loud, it's noisy, it's bloody, and it's often at their home or in a very public place. The cartels and the military that support the cartels are interested in sending a signal that this is what happens to you. They're, they're killing journalists who are actually writing about something, but they're also kill, doing a symbolic killing. They want to get more out of this than just eliminating one man or woman. And so Emilio is this tremendous symbol of Mexican journalism and independence. This would be an immediate target for this kind of activity. I agree, and I think the other thing is he's a symbol in another way. Um, and one of the ironies of this to me is that so many people, uh, there seems to be, this case seems to have been politicized in some way and yeah. caught up in this whole idea of, illegal immigration, which it is not. It is perfectly legal immigration, um, asking for asylum in a perfectly legal manner. But the other thing is, if we want secure borders, 
what is really driving people from not just Mexico but Central America to this country? It is corruption. It is corruption that prevents people from being able to guarantee that their kids are going to have a decent life or that they can have a decent life. And what is the antidote to corruption? It's journalism. It's people who m put sunshine, the best of disinfectant, on social problems. But if you are saying to journalists, there's no exit, if you do a brave thing and report about corruption in your community and you are threatened with death, right here in America, we, the home of the free, the brave, and the First Amendment, we don't have any room for you. What a chilling effect that's going to have. And in the end, it's going to drive more people to our borders, ironically, because we're not doing what we need to do, which isn't much, to help shore up civil institutions, one of the most important of which is journalism, in these societies. I mean, absolutely. I get that it's a, it's a hard question. If we make it easy for journalists to depart Mexico if they're, if they're at risk, you know, do we encourage them to depart? I think, the, I think of it the other way, as you were saying, that if you let journalists know that if they're going to take the next step and the next step and they're going to be brave in their work, that there could be a place they could go to get relief you're going to encourage them to stay there and do the work the right way. Absolutely. And you and I have worked with enough journalists in exile to know this. Nobody wants to leave home. No. You're right. Nobody wants to be divorced from their family, their language, their culture, their food. I mean, I would just ask everybody who's listening to this to think about how you would feel. Um, I work with journalists in exile now and you know one of the things I said to one of the Afghan an Afghan journalist who's at the University of Missouri is I said this is going to be a very hard couple of months for you at first because you're going to feel like there's this really smart person inside mm -hmm. that nobody is seeing because I can't speak the language well and so it is very, very difficult to make this kind of transition, and nobody does it unless they're really desperate. Yeah, and, um, and you do need places like the University of Missouri, or there's a hero in this case at, at University of Michigan, our Lynette friend. Lynette Clementson, yeah. uh, an angel of journalism. You need places to be able to have them uh, not just get free, but figure things out and, and, and develop contacts in the community and things like that. And uh, Kathy and I talk about this from time to time, but that's a real empty space for us right now. I mean, there, Lynette notwithstanding, Kathy notwithstanding, there's not enough uh, of great people to be able to raise their hand and help all the people that are coming. Well, you know, I think there potentially are enough great people and enough organizations if we work together mm -hmm. and leverage our resources in an intelligent way. Um, one of the things we're seeing, um, it's, I think the really dangerous pandemic that we're facing is a pandemic of authoritarianism and oligarchy that is sweeping the world. And so almost every week, it seems like there's a new crisis where journalists are being charged with these phony charges or they're being expelled. And I think we, as the people who care about democracy, have to be as organized as the dictators who want to destroy it. And I think if we can get to that place um, with foundations, think tanks, places like the National Press Club, journalism schools, if we band together and organize, we can make space to not, as Lynette, our great friend at the Knight Wallace House at the University of Michigan likes to say, it's not enough to save the journalists, we have to save the journalism. That's a very good point. And you know, when we're talking about these cases, we are frequently being critical of an authoritarian government or a, a foreign government. And so I think the Emilio case is among other things, so interesting to me, to us, because this is the United States government, and we do expect more from them in this case. And, and the duration of this case, it's, it's been years that he's been in limbo. This is somebody who wants asylum, wants to be ultimately be an American. 
He's lived here. He's been part of community. He raised his son in the United States. Exactly. And and you know what? What do we do to get past this? Well, I think one thing is we we've got to be able to criticize our own government when they are wrong in this, and not just spend uh, the press freedom campaigns on dictators. Who, yeah. who uh, I'm not letting them off the hook, but. Part of the reason we have a th the authority, the moral authority, to do that kind of work is that, yes, we will do that. We will press those kind of cases against our own government, our absolutely, own system. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it was interesting. I faced a somewhat skeptical audience a, a year or so ago when I was in Niger in West Africa, a very troubled place, um, and I was doing some journalism training with some of my colleagues at Mizzou, and um, it was funded by the State Department. And so, of course, in, you know, in West Africa, there's a lot of competition for influence. And so some of the journalists, because they're good journalists, were saying, well, what makes the United States better than Russia or China or whatever? And I said, well, uh, I'm here. I'm here with the funding from my government to talk to you. But I've also filed a lawsuit against my government. Yeah. And I showed them the FOIA case that we have filed against uh, the Department of Homeland Security. And so, yes, I think this is a, an absolute disgrace. It's not just a disgrace that the U.S. government, um, which should be standing up for the free press and should be helping somebody who did everything right, um, that is not the only disgrace. We're wasting taxpayer money yeah, very... fighting this case. I mean, I'm sorry, we're going to go to the Supreme Court if we have to, right? I mean, at the National Press Club. And we have, thank God, we have lawyers who are working for us pro bono, First Amendment lawyers, immigration lawyers. There are really good people working on this case because they know what's right and what's wrong. And why is the government fighting us? It's just, it, it's such a waste of money. I mean, go use my tax dollars to nab drug dealers or really bad people. Don't use them to really persecute a journalist. Well, we were both in a courtroom in El Paso and saw this. Uh, it's chilling when you see Emilio at the defense table and his lawyer and then the prosecutor is the United States government. It's the Department of Homeland Security is prosecuting the case. And, you know, if they decided, hey, now that I'm really looking at this, this doesn't feel like the right sort of thing, they can drop it. They are pressing this case. They are trying their hardest to send this person back who is at risk for his life. Well, and it's almost as if, you know, the train's out of the station, so nobody's willing to put the brake on it. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, it's paging Franz Kafka. Why are we doing this? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. No. Um, and, I, and I also want to say that, you know, I think there are very good people who would like to do the right thing, and there are some really bad actors in this case. And uh, we ran up against some of them uh, in that courtroom, and we also ran up against some of them, you did, actually, uh, when you were there to visit Emilio and basically somebody tried to bully you into shutting up. Yeah, so th at the detention, which looks like a prison, th that's the headquarters for ICE. So we asked, after seeing Emilio, we asked for a meeting with ICE. And um, they did grant us a meeting with their attorneys and with the, the key leaders of that bureau, which has a very uh, harsh reputation. Um, it's got the worst, uh, the worst percentage of asylum grants in the country. It's yeah. sort of ninety some percent, ninety five or six Rejections. percent are sent back. So they are not in the asylum business. They are not looking to help people who either need the help or deserve the help, which both were Emilio's case. So yeah, a little conference table and and. Uh, and Congressman O'Rourke was there, uh, and Emilio's attorney was there. They basically warned us, warned me, uh, saying that we should tone it down, tone down our presentation. And we told them we weren't there to tone it down. We wanted people to know what was going on with Emilio. And we had a news conference that day, later at one o'clock. And what they were trying to do was get us to, you know, not play our best cards or maybe cancel the news conference, that sort of thing. 
And so that was really a strange episode to me. And, um, you know, they, they went to the extreme uh, measure of putting out a news release later saying they didn't say it to tone it down. But they said it in front of a congressman. They said it in front of a couple of different lawyers. You know, everybody heard this. And um, so I think and by they the think way, some of the communications I've reviewed, mm -hmm. um, the heaviest redactions are around that date. Yeah, yes. they, I think they regretted it. And uh, yeah, I do too. Uh, but you know, that's part of what we were trying to do was get under their skin a little bit and push it a little bit. But that's the only way to show them what they're doing is outrageous. Well, and I think this came after weeks of trying to have reasonable conversations yeah. and asking, please tell us why this is happening. And um, and so, uh, yeah, it, you got to a point where I, I remember saying to you in a conversation, we have to go to DEF CON 5 on yeah. this. <laughs> well, the, the place was crowded. They had, yeah. they had, the week before we got there, they had released 30 people from the detention because overcrowding. And here's a guy who's not harmed anyone, is not dangerous, is not going anywhere. You know, let him out. I mean, I think... It makes you wonder if this is something personal, and that's why we've asked uh, for a Freedom of Information Act. And I want to give a shout out to the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, which is our lawyer in this case. And uh, the lawyers there have been tenacious and very, very helpful in pushing this case. And we will not drop it until we either get that information or Emilio gets the asylum he deserves. Yeah, one of the really interesting things that Kathy, when, she's, when you're talking about um, the idea that um, he's being targeted, Emilio is not a U.S. citizen, but even U.S. citizens who are in the United States have protections of the First Amendment. Yeah, even non-U.S. citizens. Non -US yes, citizens. everybody in the United States has First Amendment so protection. Even if you're yes. a, a Mexican yes. journalist. And so it is relevant that uh, our country is targeting him, following these processes. And really it's for his outspokenness, I think. And that's what the redactions are going to show. That, I think, is the reason the judge um, in the habeas corpus case was willing to take it. He felt there was sufficient evidence that Emilio was being targeted for giving the speech at the press club that uh, he was willing to take this case. Um, when Emilio was freed, that mooted the habeas case. Um, but that's when we renewed our Freedom of Information request. Um, but this could all be done if, uh, as you said, um, the Biden administration just did the right thing here. It was started, this whole um, misadventure was started uh, under the Trump administration. So uh, President Biden has made his contempt for the, his predecessor pretty uh, obvious. It's uh, really surprising to me that we're spending time and money, uh, that his administration is spending time and money carrying that water. I agree. So let's. Uh tell people, where are we now? Where is Emilio? What's he doing? How's he doing? Um, Emilio is living in, um, in or near Ann Arbor, um, Michigan, where he, um, once he was released from uh, detention, he was uh, accepted by uh, Lynette Clemenson at the very prestigious Knight Wallace uh, Journalism Fellowship Program. He spent a year there. As Emilio does everywhere, uh, he made loads of friends, and uh, he is now working for one of those friends in Ann Arbor. He is sadly not doing journalism. Uh, his son also has a good job and a, a lot of friends. So uh, we want to make sure that um, they both get to stay where they want to be. And I would say that the one lesson I've learned from all this is we need to work harder and intervene sooner to help journalists under stress so they can keep being journalists. Yes, uh, I agree with all that, Kathy. Thank you. And he is on his final appeal before the Board of Immigration Appeals. So it is possible that he could be granted asylum finally. It is also possible that he could be deported at this late time. Well, if the Board of Immigration Appeals uh, decides against Emilio, uh, we have the option, he has the option, uh, with our help, of appealing to the federal courts. And I'm just putting you on notice, Department of Homeland Security. We're going to keep 
coming until justice is done. Well, that's an encouraging note, I think. Let's, uh, let's hope it's sooner rather than later. And I want to just say thank you to you, Kathy, for all you've done in this case. And it's been a pleasure working with you. Let's hope we can get it settled soon for Emilio. Agreed. And thanks to the National Press Club for all the work it does for press freedom. Thank you.